Hello and welcome to Written in Uncertainty, an Elder Scrolls podcast sat firmly in the grey maybe of Tamriel. My name is Aramithius, and today I'm discussing one of the most contentious texts within the Elder Scrolls, one that was written to end a war and possibly just started another one. A text that has called for the birth of new worlds, new ideas, and a perfect marriage. Today we're asking, what is Coda? Before we kick off properly, a few notices. If you'd like to support this podcast, please review it on iTunes or wherever you listen. I also have a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash written in uncertainty if you want to support me in a more ongoing fashion, or an account with Kofi if you just want to leave me a quick tip. Links will be in this podcast description and in the blog post that accompanies this cast at written in uncertainty.wordpress.com. Also, while I hope there's little difference in the audio quality of my content, I'm now recording and uploading these podcasts to YouTube, as well as producing the usual audio-only content. When I start referencing visual stuff, they will also be appearing in the video, but for those of you that are just listening to the audio, they will be available in the blog posts. And also, the Written in Uncertainty close reads videos that I've been producing so far will also be coming to a podcast format. I will have to see how this goes moving forward, and hopefully the amount of multimedia stuff that I'm now doing won't break me. And finally, my usual disclaimer, this is my own understanding of Coda, and definitely not the whole truth of it. The very concept that Coda has come to represent in the community somewhat precludes that. If you have your own ideas of what Coda represents, please leave a comment on YouTube on this podcast's blog post at writteninuncertainty.wordpress.com or join the conversation at the Written in Uncertainty Discord server. The blog post will also have links to all the texts that I'm discussing in this cast, so please go and check them out rather than just taking what I say at face value. There are also tons of what is coda type texts out there and threads on places like Reddit. So take a look at some of those as well, including Lady Nerevar's fantastic description of what is coda in introduction on the Tesla subreddit as well. Links for all this will be in the blog post and the description for this video if you're watching on YouTube. So what is coda? For those of you that have seen this written down, it's kind of weird because it has a zero where the O should be. That's kind of a nod to its original meaning as much as anything else, I think. In music, a coda is a section of a piece of music that's explicitly designed to give the music a feeling of conclusion. From where I've seen it used, the music will basically run to a point where a senyo sign is makes you go back to repeat a passage which you then play until you get told to go to the coda and then from the coda sign onwards is the finishing part of the music which is there to give it a satisfying conclusion. The symbol for the coda itself is a zero with crosshairs on it which makes me think that that's why we have the zero in the coda whereas you can't really get the musical notation symbol for coda on a normal keyboard that's what a coda is in the normal musical sense of the term in the elder scrolls it's come to mean several things we'll get the different ways that people use it later but the most basic and first answer to it is that it's a comic book script that was written by Michael Kirkbride and published on Valentine's Day in 2014 and was teased with the Love Letter from the Fifth Era, which was released on the 12th of September 2005. Coda was originally intended to be fully developed with artwork, but from what I gather, that kind of fell apart part way through. What artwork there is, is absolutely fantastic. I do urge you to go to coda.es, that's c0da.es, and check it out. It looks absolutely awesome, which is also where you'll find the text to read it if you haven't already. And my advice when you are reading it is 
take a minute or so to read each sentence, kind of soak it in. The way that it's written as a comic book script means that the dialogue tends to take center stage and so the descriptions you tend to rush over a little. But there's an awful lot of stuff in those descriptions that's helpful to visualize what's going on and add some more information. One of the things that it does remind me of is the Kill Six Billion Demons webcomic and Coda was published at around the same time that Kill Six Billion Demons sprang into being but I'm not sure whether it's that Coda is being influenced by Kill Six Billion Demons or whether Kill Six Billion Demons is being influenced by Coda or potentially by the Elder Scrolls as a whole. There are some very very obvious references to some of the more esoteric side of the series as a whole within that webcomic. So I'm not sure which came first, but the aesthetics seem very, very similar to me. Coda's story is set in the 911th year of the fifth era of Mundus. This is a long way after the games that we've seen so far, and Nern has been destroyed by a new medium that has returned in an event called Landfall. The Khajiit and the Dunmer fled to the moons in a spaceship called the Wonderweir, and they have existed beneath the surface in a settlement called Ald Sotha below ever since. The protagonist is Jubal Lunsul, a Dunmer who is introduced after a lot of pseudo techno babble and stuff that kind of carries on and sets the scene that this is the future and it's got modern stuff. Jubal's first action after we meet him is then to go to his friend Lalu here and announce that he's going to marry someone once he kills the new Midian. Then we get a rather bizarre segue that tends to confuse a lot of people. Jubal is shopping for a weapon with here and then gets confronted with a bunch of floating fingers which are called the digitals and then Vivek turns up to help out with the shopping as you do and things get a little odd from there. The story digresses into various stories about how the Dunma on the moons see Vivek and the tribunal. There are about three stories told here the last of which is a version of events where the tribunal is portrayed very like the Justice League or the Avengers and winds up beating up television headed things that are coming from another dimension to take everyone over and make everyone mindless consumers. Once that storyline ends, which is rather abrupt in my opinion, we're back to the present day and Jubal is prepping for surgery by smoking skooma and sounding quite a lot like the digitals did. Remember that it's going to be important for later. He then has his hands cut off by Kajiti sugar surgeons who here pays for um, and then he throws a bachelor party because that's perfect post-op stuff. There are various people that turn up to either insult Jubal or be insulted by him or both. There's a mixture of gods and important figures here. We have the Hist, we have Kine, and we have Talos. And Talos explicitly gets called a virus by Jubal, and he takes great offense to this term. Eventually, Jubal and Talos make up, and there's a few significant words exchanged as they're both merrily drunk outside of the corner club where Jubal held his party. Most particularly, Talos accuses Jubal of knowing what he's doing because he's cut his hands off and Jubal calls Talos Lokan. Jubal then confronts the Numidium and essentially asks why it's destroying everything. I mean, it's a fair question. Um, the Numidium emits a lot of empty speech bubbles and eventually admits that it has unfinished business, which is the Grey Maybe itself. Jubal then declares that the Numidium just wanted to win and cuts off its head with its own empty speech bubble. The comic then cuts to Jubal's wedding preparation, which is crashed by the Morag Tong, who it turns out were hired by here using the money that he said was for the surgery. Apparently, the Khajiit would cut off a Dunma's hands for free without having to worry about it, so Jubal had some sort of advance warning on this because he had some feeling about that. Jubal develops ghost hands and fights off the Tong 
and kills them all and strangles here. Jubal and Vivek then get married, officiated by Lokan, whose heart heals throughout the ceremony and also had a dragon inside it to start with and which then starts to eat itself and eventually disappear. The final image of the comic is of a baby made of flowers and the comic ends with this line. New language, continued meaning, string strand of both, meaning remains, welcome to the house of we. Uh, that's something of a quick whistle stop tour of the plot of Coda and I've skimmed over a few bits. I'll get to those little complications and elaborations once I've gone over what Coda is beyond just being a comic. A lot of fans have taken Coda to be the literal future of the Elder Scrolls. This seems to particularly come up when people talk about Coda as something they don't like, something that means that the events in the games don't matter. I mean, if you know that the world's going to carry on until at least the fifth era, then why bother defeating Alduin and saving the world or making sure that Dagothur is dead if you know the world's going to carry on anyway and then be stomped on by the Numidium. I guess this may have a point if you want to have a sense of keeping a sense of mystery about the games and it's essentially reading ahead if you like and learning the ending before you finish the story but I'm not really sure that that matters personally. It's not something that I fuss about in whatever medium I'm reading at the time or engaging with at the time. I'm not too fussed about spoilers and I would hope that it goes more or less without saying that even without spoilers that the hero wins at the end of the day is generally the way that most forms of media go. I've also not heard anyone say that the plot of The Elder Scrolls Online doesn't matter because we have the main game series set after them, for example. It strikes me as a little bit disingenuous when people make that sort of argument. I also think it doesn't hold too much weight because Coda doesn't really try to pretend that it totally fits with the main series. It contradicts the ending of The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, for example, where the new medium is destroyed because the new medium is obviously still here. And similarly, Vivek is heavily involved in Coda and he went missing and was possibly dead after the events of the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. There are potentially answers for this in that the current universe of the Elder Scrolls has one version of the New Medium potentially still laying siege to Alinor ever since Tiber Septim first invaded with it if you take some of Michael Kirkbride's forum posts and that sort of thing into account. So there's a potential version of the new medium that could come back by the fifth era. And there's also a possibility that Vivek could still be alive at that point. I mean, Z is only noted as having disappeared, not having died after the events of the Nereverine, if you look at what's actually said in the third edition pocket guide. However, I don't think that this strict continuity actually matters too much for Coda. Michael Kirkbride has stated that the text is a thematic ending for Morrowind and the text uses a variety of tools to achieve a thematic completion of that narrative. It's not necessarily a literal one. It doesn't really need to take the events of Oblivion and Skyrim into account and that sort of thing, although they are assumed. Within the descriptions of Coda, there's a lot of symbolic changes that may not necessarily be literal. We have Kind's head changing shape mid-conversation and Lorcan's heart warping in various ways and various other things like superheroes referencing pop-up blockers and that sort of thing. These make more sense to me if you're looking at the text not as something that's directly happening and has to match up with every single instance of the continuity so far but as a thematic exploration of ideas that are going on things that are potentially acting as a cipher for others within the narrative i think there's also a hint that this is a comic book which if you look at the way that marvel and dc function with their various continuities plural that should tell you something about how coda is treated 
and particularly if you're looking at the ways of metaphor, the TV heads sequence, which is the one that seems to confuse everyone, could potentially be a retelling of the blight in another way. The way that the TV heads take over people and make them do things and spread their message sounds very, very like what Dagoth Ur was up to when spre in spreading the blight. So I think this passage is a good example of how Coda can be used to recontextualize existing stories. It's also possible that things are a bit wobbly because there are explicit references in the text to memory and time having run out. So the events of Coda are a bit all over the place because causality is all over the shop. But I don't think that's really applied consistently enough for it to be a proper answer within the narrative. And there's also another way of looking at Coda, which I've kind of touched on, which Lady Nerevar points out in What is Coda an Answer, which suggests that Coda is simply a retelling of an Elder Scrolls story in another way and not meant to be attached to it. And so it's not meant to be part of that continuity. To quote what she said, Think of the Elder Scrolls universe, the universe, not the games, as Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Each game book, art piece, playthrough, etc., are then different versions of this one central piece of fiction, just like there are many different editions of a Shakespeare play. There are books, movies, theatre productions, audiobooks, a ballet, but they're all Romeo and Juliet. Some of the editions make only minor edits to the real original work of fiction, while others make sweeping alterations. Coda, in this analogy, is something like West Side Story. This makes Coda free to explore narrative ideas in a way that's pretty much impossible within the main Elder Scrolls series, because it's essentially only retaining the trappings of the original series at a thematic or allegorical level. Lady Nerevar also describes Coda as speculative fiction about an already fictional universe, which again underlines the point of taking a story and messing with its genre. If you look at things like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies as an example of texts that do this with well-loved classics that we already know. However, that really hasn't been the way that the narrative has been taken by fans, I must admit, and in a way, in the text itself, there's a variety of events that have happened between the games and Coda, which Coda assumes have happened. So it's not entirely a retelling of the Elder Scrolls stories in a different way, because the time difference effectively assumes that all this stuff has happened before. It assumes that you've had Alduin being defeated by the last Dragonborn. It assumes that you've had all that time going on. And so it almost doesn't fit even within its own terms. The love letter is potentially a way that you can reconcile all this in that it makes Coda a possible future that doesn't happen. The love letter says this and words like it explicitly. I tell you now, brothers and sisters of the coming forth, that the holy scripture of love contains all you need to avoid the perils of landfall. And there are various other quotes that are similar things like no love to avoid landfall it suggests that numidium's return can be avoided the love letter is written by jubal as a message to the past explicitly as a means to avoid landfall as a result and therefore it means that the situation that produces coda isn't inevitable this means that if the love letter does appear in the past then you can probably avert landfall. There's a way to get out of it. And so Coda may well not happen at all. The term Coda itself has been taken by some of the fandom to be a moniker for either a recontextualization of the Elder Scrolls or an exploration of the future of the universe. If you check out texts like a Khajiit Coda, an Awesomer Coda, a Shortened Flippers Coda, or even a Space Falmer Coda, all of these are stories that happen in the future of Tamriel, generally after landfall and within that sort of continuity, within Coda's own continuity, if you like. The term itself has kind of been taken to mean writings that address the future of the Elder Scrolls. As well as talking about the kind of texts that Coda is and the kind of texts that 
Coda has encouraged, it also has quite an explicit ideological component. It's been taken as a mission statement that the notion of canon and intellectual property are not things that really need to be considered with the Elder Scrolls, then shouldn't be seen as things to limit the Elder Scrolls and how people interact with that particular universe. Tosok, one of the members of the old Bethesda forums, has put it this way. Canon is a modern concept that is really only relevant in an era that recognises intellectual property rights, where narrative is a profit-driven endeavour and stories are owned by corporations. The mythologies of the past were ever-evolving, tweaked by hundreds of anonymous storytellers, changing, growing, self-contradicting and alive. This story protests the modern situation. It's a showdown between corporate canon and ancient open source storytelling. So we have Jubal slay Numidium and marry Vivek. Numidium represents the non-contributor who sits back and naysays everyone else's ideas instead of inventing their own Tamriel. Jubal's eventual accusation is that this sort of thinking secretly wants a victor, a version that wins at the expense of everyone else. This is why Jubal cuts off his hands. He's not engaging in an argument. He's embracing all versions of Tamriel and declaring everything equally valid. This is why the story ends in a marriage. Compromise and happy coexistence instead of a battle between ideas. This leads to the birth of the Amaranth. You, or I guess we, taking ownership of the Elder Scrolls myth back from Bethesda and making our own contributions without worrying about which is truer. That's a lovely explanation of some of the paratextual stuff that's going on in Coda. It's a way of telling multiple stories in whatever way is valid. It's also why we have multiple stories about where Vivek came from. We have the repeated references to Witch Nerevar and the creation of a new universe as part of Coda. It's basically an expression that means every person's experience of the Elder Scrolls is valid and that people can and should do what they want with the Elder Scrolls lore. But there have been a few problems with this, most particularly that it's been taken as a reductio ad absurdum in some places, and you'll see the phrase Coda makes it canon doing the rounds somewhere. This is basically someone saying, hey, anything goes because of Coda, therefore I don't have to justify myself. And while in a way that's true in that people can write whatever they want about whatever they like, it often gets used as a way to automatically win an argument and render whatever anyone is saying to you as null and void. That's kind of a consequence of having statements like Coda saying people can think whatever they want, but it's kind of being taken in the wrong spirit. It means that people don't have to accept what anyone else has said either. This was sort of addressed by MK after the event. There was a code of coda that he published following the text itself, which basically says, don't be an ass about it. Let other people have their fun and whatever that looks like. The way that coda makes it canon often gets used is to try and be right at all costs, which kind of defeats the point in my view. And now with all that context, what does Coda bring us in terms of an understanding of the law? It's often used as a source for various claims and hints at things that are, at the very least, the opinion of an ex-developer that created much of the current law. Um, advanced warning, this is going to be a little unstructured and it's a grab bag of things because Coda can be used in an awful lot of ways to talk about several things. Jubal's first monologue ends with talk about the worm, which is generally taken to be either a Dune reference and or the idea of a permanently broken dragon. So it's a dragon without wings and everything that that implies. Akatosh does explicitly get called worm in the narrative. And wherever Akatosh appears in Coda, it's in a broken form. It's either trapped or without wings or something that suggests it's not right. Coda is set in a time where memory is going away and time doesn't really work properly. There's a sense throughout the whole narrative that there's something out of kilter with how events happen and how they're remembered, which is a consequence of the dragon being reduced to a worm and potentially directly by the Numidian. 
the Numidium openly kills gods in the comic and in the game series has caused dragon breaks whenever it's been activated. So with the dragon finally being broken, um, all that the dragon can really do is ultimately go away, which is what happens at the end of the narrative. And I said that when time is broken, memory doesn't work properly. Jubal calls out memory specifically in various places. And we also have the phrase registered by Coda as a repeated phrase to track where his family and his bloodline come from. Exactly what Coda means within the narrative itself is unclear, but it could be some sort of database or document that records how things were, where things come from. In the absence of memory, all that people have in Coda is some device to help them remember where things were, where they come from. And there's also the digitals who have been called the coder digitals elsewhere. They are giant fingers that float around and say obnoxious things and mostly quote 36 lessons. We don't totally know what these are, but my feeling is that they are likely Jubal man manipulating events after the fact. We know from the love letter that Jubal can mess with history to a degree and his hands are missing for a good chunk of the story. He also has ghost fingers later on that are pointedly noted to be, and quote, rendered just like the digital fingers from before in the art notes for Coda. So I think it's very possible that the two are linked, and I like to think that Jubal is messing with the narrative through the digitals from a point where he's suddenly able to. And at this point is further driven home when Jubal takes his skooma trip. The dialogue that he comes out with is quite stilted and limited, and it's very similar to that of the digitals. It's entirely out of context, it's done in short sentences, and it quotes the 36 lessons a lot. There's also quite a bizarre reveal in the superhero section about the inspiration of Yagran Bagan. I didn't realise this until I connected the dots a little more. Uh, there's this bit of text in the middle of the battle that the tribunal are having with um, with Yagram. Zero method zero, people. The last time we let Yagram Bagan the intellective slip into our universe, he tried to upgrade everyone into one of his own gigantic meta delusions. This suggests that Yagram Bagan in Coda is some sort of multi-dimensional entity. I think this is a nod to Bagan's clear inspiration, which is Mojo from the Marvel comics, who basically exists in another dimension and makes beings fight for his own entertainment. Mojo was originally created as a parody of television series executives, and the inclusion of Yagram here in a place where there's a very explicit element of parody of consumer culture and television in particular going on makes me think that that element of parody of corporate culture is something that Coda is trying to reference at this point. Plus, there's some very, very obvious visual cues between Mojo and Yagram that make me think he was part of the original design process as well. And then there's the point in Coda where Jubal cuts off his hands. Talos says it's clear that he knows what he's doing because he cuts off his hands. But why is that? We do kind of get given an answer in the text itself in that it's a reference to Summon 11, which gets quoted in Coda, particularly this bit. According to the Codes of Mephala, there is no difference between the theorist and the terrorist. Even the most cherished desire disappears in their hands. This is why Mephala has black hands. Bring both of yours to every argument. The one-handed king finds no remedy. When you approach God, however, cut both of them off. God has no need of theory, and he is armoured head to toe in terror. Within the context of Coda, this lack of hands means that Jubal firstly needs help in accomplishing his goals, and secondly can't fight, but can embrace. As we saw with the quote from Tosok earlier, this has been taken by fans to be the point of Coda. Don't fight other ideas, accept them. It also means that you can't hold on to everything, you have nothing to lose, which, as the proverb goes, makes Jubal dangerous. 
that's another reason why Jubal defeats the Numidium. He was at that point detached from the world in the same way that we see the prisoners in the Elder Scrolls series being detached from the world because he cut his hands off. He didn't have anything to lose, so he was free to do anything. And if you look far enough into coded discussions online, you'll also see the notion that Jubal is a Nereverine. This isn't explicitly stated anywhere, and there's no single line of argument that supports this, but I've seen it most commonly explained as Jubal fulfilling the role of the Nereverine, doing some of the things that the Nereverine does. He forgives the Forsaken House, which instead of the Sixth House and the house Dagoth, it's the house Dwemer, which is symbolized in Coda by the Numidian, uh, frees the false gods, which is in this case Lokan and Akatosh rather than the tribunal, and he also has a rather strong relationship with Vivek, which the original Nerevar did, particularly if you read the text, What My Beloved Taught Me. I think possibly the last piece that we need to go through is the role that Talos plays in all this. Talos is revealed to be the same as Lorcan at the end of the story and is called a virus by Jubal. There are various ways that the fandom have interpreted this, but I haven't seen anything that I entirely buy as to why it is the term that's used. The best explanation that I've seen is that the combination of Hjalti, Earlybeard, Zurin, Arctus, and Wolfarth function as a botnet which emulates convention, which kind of links back to the idea of Talos being Convention 2.0, which I talked about in the episode on the Enantiomorph. It's a thing that reinforces the structure of the Arabis, but isn't fundamentally a part of it, which is where I think the idea of the virus coming in. It's something that's supplemental and additional, quite apart from anything else. And you also see the name Talos expressed as Tal OS as part of this as well, further emphasizing how this is being thought of as a computer thing as well. One final point that I don't know too much about because I haven't studied Hinduism a great deal is that Coda has thematic links to the religion. It expresses things in similar ways to the Bhagavad Gita, or at least has a similar structure to it. Uh, the Gita is a discussion between two characters about their destiny, and it ends with one of the characters realising that he has to go off and fight this war because it's his dharma to do so. And Jubal doesn't really beat the Numidium by fighting it. It beats Numidium by having an argument. And it's potentially that Jubal is also in the process of accepting his destiny in some way, which could potentially be something that Vivek has been scheming about for millennia. If we look at the parallels of Dune, which there are tons if you look particularly at Morrowind. Um, it's possible to see Jubal as the Kwisatz Haderach and Vivek as the Bene Gesserit. That basically means that Jubal is the prophesied, foreseen hero and Vivek is the thing that's pulling the strings, manipulating everything so that this hero can emerge. And it's quite possible that Vivek has been doing that to make sure that there is a Jubal and so that he can bring about the Amaranth with Vivek. The baby that Jubal and Vivek create has been taken by the fans to be that Amaranth, the seed of a new universe that moved beyond Mundus. I've done a podcast on the Amaranth fan, the Godhead, previously, so check that out if you want to know more about what that means and how I think about it. Uh, the way that the baby is produced potentially has some significance, the idea of a womb. Uh, the universe of the Elder Scrolls is created as an amaranth, and the amaranth comes from pain and sorrow, but it also comes from a process of sensory deprivation. The flower baby in Coda comes from love and celebration. It comes from a marriage, and it also comes 
from sensory deprivation because a baby experiences sensory deprivation of sorts in the womb. And so you can have this baby being birthed as an amaranth and a baby all at once without really being anything else in between. That's about all I'm going to say about Coda for now, at least not without going down a huge amount of rabbit holes of different ideas. There's a lot that's been discussed about Coda at various corners of the internet, and this could go on a lot longer, but I'm not sure quite what would be useful. So feel free to hunt down discussions and ideas about Coda. Let me know what else you want me to have a look at. And if there's enough, I will bundle things together for a follow-up episode. And then I can go through this in a bit more detail once I know what specific areas people want me to take a look at. But I don't really want to carry on stabbing in the dark uh, without really having much of a structure. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you've appreciated it, please like, subscribe, all that good stuff wherever you're listening. You can also become my patron at patreon.com forward slash written in uncertainty or drop me a tip at Kofi. I'll be putting links to all of these in the video description and on the podcast description as well. I'm also doing a survey to check out how people are seeing my stuff and how I can improve. I'll be pasting a link in the video description and in the blog post. So if you haven't already, please drop me a line. Let me know how I'm doing, what you'd like to hear more of in this podcast, and I'll get to it. And in the meantime, I also wanted to give the other Elder Scrolls podcasts out there a bit of a shout out, as there have been quite a few that have sprung up relatively recently so check out all the other elder scrolls podcasts that are starting to come out of the woodwork we've got some great elder scrolls online news and content and some fantastic refreshes on the basics of the elder scrolls law in the law seekers podcast which has come up for its one year anniversary recently congratulations guys the elder scrolls law cast is about five or six episodes in and covers the basics of the law in bite-sized pieces. We've also got the Selectives Lawcast, which I've been part of for the past year or so. That's currently only available on YouTube, but I've been making rough moves to put it into a podcast form. We will get there, and I'll let you know when it happens. It's actually also been going on for about four years on and off, so there's a lot of content there. So please do check them out. They were one of my biggest inspirations in starting Written in the Uncertainty. We also have Tales of Tamriel, which is an actual play Elder Scrolls Online podcast, which has snippets of lore sprinkled throughout the whole thing and is generally quite a fun conversation about the Elder Scrolls Online and the state of the game. And finally, uh, the UESP have started a podcast up very recently Um, I can't remember quite how many episodes they are in, I think about four, but they are currently only available on Twitch and YouTube, and they have lore sections in there amidst all the community news and updates that are also part of that. So enjoy those until next time, where we will be looking at the overseer of several of the events in Coda, and the one who is responsible for most of what we know of in the Elder Scrolls existing at all. Next time we're asking... Who is Lorcan? Until then, this podcast remains a letter written in uncertainty. You've been listening to Written in Uncertainty, a podcast written and presented by Aramithius. The music for this podcast has been kindly provided by Jan Glembotsky and Jeremy Saul. You can find Jan's work on SoundCloud under Songs from the Lost Land, and Jeremy's Northern Diaries is available for purchase and on YouTube. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.